Welcome back to Web3 Unpacked, everyone. I'm Rich Pasqua, and joining us today is Alex Svenovic, co-founder and CEO of Nansen, an analytics platform built for the blockchain that unifies on-chain data with essential market signals. Welcome, Alex. Thanks for having me, Rich. Happy to be here. Yeah, um, we're happy to have you. Um, I started digging into a little bit of your background and your product and um, really good stuff. And you, you've got a fairly intense background in AI. And at your core, you're a data scientist, right? And an entrepreneur having led a, a few companies now. Um, but, you know, AI and data science, and, and, you know, and business, these are all great combinations for a modern technology uh, platforms such as Nansen. So that's awesome. Uh, lots to learn here. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, I think before we jumped on, I've been digging into the the platform and you've definitely piqued my curiosity as a <laughs> kind of a quasi trader, if you will, um, crypto guy uh, for many years. But um, before we get into the nuts and bolts of Nansen in the, in the platform itself, we always like to kind of find out how people started their Web3 journey. Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. So um, as you mentioned, my background originally or academically is in AI before it was cool, I should mention. So I graduated <laughs> with a degree in AI back in 2010 um, from the University of Edinburgh in the UK. Uh, and worked a couple of years in management consulting, try to learn uh, a bit more about business in general, uh, everything from seafood to insurance and banking and luxury retail and all sorts of interesting things. Then I moved on to work more specifically as a data scientist in a media group uh, called Shibstead. Uh, it's a classifieds group, and I was there four years. And uh, I moved down from Oslo to Barcelona in, I think it was 2016. And one of the guys in the office there was very enthusiastic about Ethereum. And so that's really how I kind of fell down the rabbit hole in 2017. This was just when ICOs were getting very hot. So it was kind of a double whammy where I had these guys who were very excited about Ethereum pitching it to me. And I quite liked the idea of a platform that you could, um, you know, issue different digital assets, create smart contracts, applications that were permissionless and all these different things. And at the same time, you had the ICO boom that kind of probably appealed to the greedy nature uh, of, of my mm. personality. And so uh, that's kind of how I started uh, looking into crypto. I had ignored Bitcoin for many years. I didn't really believe in it, but for some recent Ethereum appealed to me a, a lot more. Uh, and then long story short, I left my job, uh, moved to Hong Kong to join a, a crypto company. And uh, that's kind of how my journey started and how I started working in Web3 full time. Awesome. And it's interesting that you went through the Ethereum door rather than the Bitcoin mm. door. Um, for me, it was Bitcoin, then Ethereum. Ethereum kind of blew my mind with different layers of technology and everything else. Um, fantastic. And um, yeah, now you're putting all of your uh, education and smarts and business knowledge into Nansen, which is, is really, really great. Um, now, can you give us um, a general overview of Nansen and what it's, what, it, what you can do with it? Yeah, absolutely. So the starting point for why we, why we built Nansen in the first place is, you know, I thought that on-chain data was the most interesting information source and the most unique to Web3. You, of course, have market data. You have, you know, things like price charts, volume charts. You have uh, sentiment data through social networks and all sorts of different things. But those aren't really unique to Web3 and crypto. The on-chain part is the thing that I found super interesting. And so... That, and then at the same time, uh, back in 2019, we also didn't feel like the crypto investors had a great on-chain analytics product. 
the only on-chain analytics products that were around that were, I think, powerful at the time was uh, things like Chainalysis, which focused more on AML and mm -hmm. illicit use of crypto. But we felt that you know, the man in the arena should also have uh, you know, his analytics tool so that they can better understand what is actually happening on-chain. Uh, and so that's why we started building Nelson to surface the signal and help create winners uh, in the future of finance, which is our mission. So uh, at the core, Nelson basically helps you invest better. So that means it helps you discover what are the tokens that, quote unquote, smart money uh, are buying, or maybe what are the tokens that they're selling? It helps you understand uh, for specific assets that you can look up, whether it's NFTs or tokens. What does the supply look like? Uh, who actually owns the tokens? Where do all these tokens sit? Uh, because if you go to kind of a block explorer, you might see a bunch of addresses holding tokens, but you don't know who's behind it. So that was the other insight we had that we thought um, we could uh, help users better understand you know, who's actually behind the different wallets. And so at this point, we have hundreds of millions of addresses tagged up with information to say, this is a Binance wallet, this is um, a market maker's specific wallet, this is the multi-sig of a team and so on. And it just helps you better understand where the different tokens are, are sitting. So uh, at the core, you know, what we do is we help investors surface the signal and ultimately help them win and grow their portfolios. Uh, and then there are a couple of areas we've expanded into over the years. Uh, so one thing that I'm really excited about is portfolio tracking, which we have a separate product for, but it's going to be merged into the main product uh, this year. And with that portfolio tracking product, you can track, uh, I think it's 50 different blockchains, your holdings across all of those blockchains. You can track your holdings in 500 different DeFi protocols. And uh, it's just a snappy and easy way for you to check, you know, how much your pro portfolio is up, which is something that people check compulsively these days with the, the prices being where they are. Ah, uh, my goodness. We are definitely in a bull run, aren't we, Alex? Um, it's, very, <laughs> yes. it's really exciting. And that excitement just kind of makes everyone on all levels uh, excited. Um, and, you know, one thing you mentioned in there, Alex, is all of this data is actually available to users mm. or most of it, I should say. Um, and, you know, I know I've tried to do exactly what your platform is doing on my own and it's difficult. It's, it's a little challenging. You have to know where to go. You know how to, you have to know how to parse the data and, and really read the, the signals. Um, but you're doing it, you're bringing it all into focus uh, mm. for, for almost anyone. And that, that leads me to another question. You know, who is your core audience? Because I started looking at it at first blush and I'm like, oof, I'm not an analyst or a tr like a true trader, but I do dabble in this and I do trade and I want better knowledge. I want more knowledge uh, mm. and, and better analytics. And, and I want to, you know, further my investment learning. So who's it made yeah. for? It's really made for the on-chain investor. That's at least how I think about it. And that's kind of a broad... On the one hand, it's a very niche category of users. On, on the other hand, it's quite broad. So I think of it mostly as a product that's for uh, quite active, quite sophisticated investors who... And when I say sophisticated, it doesn't mean that you have to have a long investment thesis behind everything you do. But you're probably not buying, say, Bitcoin for the first time using our product. This is more for people who probably have a couple of years experience in crypto. Uh, they want to kind of have an edge versus the rest of the market, which interestingly, and we could talk about that separately, is I think one of the unique characteristics of crypto markets because they're so fragmented and new and still not that professionalized that you can have an edge uh, depending on you know, what you're looking at in crypto. So the core, the core uh, user is really an on-chain investor. It could be an individual investor. Uh, it could be full-time funds, right? The top market makers, the top trading firms use our product. We do have a couple of other more enterprise geared uh, uh, offerings as well. So we work a lot with chains, the teams behind the chains, um, you know, 
most of the top blockchain teams are customers of ours, but they look at it from a perspective of how can they grow their ecosystems. And we work with a lot of the exchanges so that they can better understand the flows of what's happening on chain. You know, when someone withdraws um, tokens from, you know, a Coinbase or a Binance, where do they actually send it? So we help exchanges understand that kind of stuff too. But at, at the core, I would say that the investor, the on-chain investor is our core uh, focus. And, you know, it is kind of the type of product where I think of it as like, you want to track the smart money with Dunson, but eventually you want to be smart money yourself. And so that's kind of who we're building the product for. And that is the goal, right? To kind of, you know, build your portfolio, whether it be for your company or your personally. And, you know, after I started kind of digging in a little bit, I'm like, wow, th I can actually use this. This is, yeah. this is going to be really cool. I, as an individual, I was pretty excited to kind of go through some of your tutorials uh, and watch some of the videos and read up on it. And it was, it was, it's pretty exciting for the individual. I'll, I'll just say that. Um, so I probably will be dipping into That's it awesome. soon. Um, Love to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. It's really cool. Um, so you know, you guys can track tons of, of stuff, uh, assets, uh, NFTs being one of NFT collections. You were just, you were mentioning what, what's the, yeah. like, you not the full suite, but what are some of the big assets that you're tracking now? Is it everything? Is it limited? Yeah. So specifically for NFTs, we, uh, basically track, um, uh, everything that's on Ethereum we track and we're, probably the best product out there to track NFTs. Like I've met so many people who, if, you know, if, if I'm wearing a Nansen t-shirt or for whatever reason, they, if I introduce myself, I say, you know, I'm Alex, I'm the founder of Nansen. They will be like, oh, I've made so much money flipping NFTs using, <laughs> using Nansen. So Ethereum is, is probably the main one because that's historically where you've had the most uh, NFT traction. We also have Solana support for NFTs. We have uh, mm -hmm. Polygon support, a few other chains that we're adding. Um, so you can really track pretty much like any NFTs, uh, on our platform. And it kind of starts with what we call NFT paradise, which is a ranking of the most traded NFT collections. And then you can go down and look at any specific NFT collection to see who's actually buying this, like who, who are the wallets that are behind the surge in price of pudgy penguins, like who's actually mm -hmm. buying these pudgy penguin NFTs. Maybe you can also look at other NFTs like azuki and find out who's selling them not to not to pick on azuki but you can basically track uh, uh pretty much any nft the what we don't track right now in terms of the nft landscape is um anything that's kind of uh, on bitcoin right so like the whole inscriptions and ordinals and all that stuff that we're not tracking at least not yet i think we have to see if if it kind of has staying power which is one of the big challenges we have building the product to find out like what are the things that are just a flash in the pan and what are the things that are actually going to stick around for a while. Um, so that's on the NFT front. And then on the token front, we track, um, we track about 15 different chains in the Nansen kind of core product. We also, like I said earlier, allow you to track your portfolio across about 50 chains. Right. So, uh, and then we also have a programmatic product called Nonsense Query, which supports more than 20 different chains where people can write their own SQL queries, get API endpoints and things like that. So you can, you can track almost, almost anything that is worth tracking with Nonsense. Yeah. And it sounds like you're not trying to boil the ocean just yet. You're, you're sticking with the very foundational uh, assets and, and, and tokens and, and networks for that matter. Um, What's yeah, I mean, and, that's right. And yeah. and I think this this is one of the core kind of strategic questions we always have to ask ourselves, like, hey, is this chain worth integrating? Or is it going to be kind of uh, old news a month from now, right? Uh, because it does take a bit of engineering power to to figure that out. And And then are there specific topics like Web3 gaming or, you know, ordinals or inscriptions or, you know, whatever things... Uh, are out there and you have to be it's almost like you're doing it in it it's kind of meta in a way but it's almost like you're doing your own type of investing but instead of money it's engineering bandwidth right so you have to find out like what are the things that are worth betting your your time on 
And that is a challenge. And it, just, it requires us to be very crypto native and to stay very close to what's happening and what's actually interesting in crypto. Yeah, absolutely. And having come from a product background myself, you know, like a product teams get excited. They want to dump, every, you know, they want to go for everything. But you got to release, you got to be smart about how, you, especially in this space, you have to be smart about how you release um, new features and tools to people. Um, one, you don't want to overwhelm them. And two, you want to make sure they work. And to your point, make sure that this blockchain is actually going to be in existence uh, f for the foreseeable future. These are all exactly. things that people don't see in this, you know, outside of the Web3 world. Um, so that's great. Um, now, for for myself and for other people, our listeners, can I can I build my own analysis models and perhaps share them and compare them with other people? That's a great question. So initially, Nonsen was very much kind of like what you see is what you get. And it was not really personalized or you couldn't customize it. But this is something we've focused a lot on in the new version of Nonsen, which is called Nonsen 2. Uh, and there are several things you can personalize and customize in it, which is quite cool. I'll mention a couple of different ways that people can, can do this. The first one is like the basics. On the homepage, you can, you can basically pin charts uh, and insights that you find throughout the platform and you get your own kind of personalized home home page, right? That's that's relatively basic, but that's something we didn't have before. The next thing is you can create what's uh, what we call smart segments. And this is a really unique and interesting feature, which I think might you know be one of the uh, great alpha sources in this bull market. And we've just uh, released a couple of new features to it. But basically what it does is instead of us telling you, you know, here's a set of 100 wallets that we classify as smart money. I mean, we all, all also do that. But now we give you a tool that allows you to configure which wallets you think are interesting into a segment. And so think about this as, hey, I want to see the top 100 tether holders, but I want to exclude all exchanges. I want to exclude all smart contracts. I want to look at kind of the individuals or like the externally owned uh, account addresses that own Tether. And then I want to be able to track them and highlight them throughout the product. Or I could say, I want to look at the first 50 or 100 wallets that bought Bored Apes uh, mm. or the ones that made at least 100 ETH you know, in trading profits of Bored Apes. And I can save that as my own smart segment. And that segment, you can profile it and you can see what are you, what, what are they buying now, first of all, right? Collectively as a segment, you get like a feed of every transaction they've made collectively. And you can use this as a filter in existing dashboards. So this is one way that we are kind of allowing people to do their own analysis, but in a pretty novel way that I, at least I haven't seen this in any other product. And it doesn't require you to code, right? So it's all kind of drag and drop, you just select, you know, traded this token, made this much money, and that you can save it very quickly as a as a smart segment. So that's the, the second kind of personalized uh, component. The third thing is we also have what we call smart alerts. This is one of our more popular features. And like, if you just look at our retention rates and what kind of leads to some kind of magic moment in the product, it's often surrounding our smart alerts. So when people activate alerts for specific events that take place on chain, uh, that's, and then you can get those alerts piped into your Telegram, into your Discord or your Slack. Mm -hmm. That's another thing where you can be quite creative and come, come up with what are interesting events that you want to track on chain. For example, every time someone makes a million dollar transaction in some token like Beam or Cypher or whatever long tail token you're looking at, you can get a notification of that into your Telegram. So that's another thing uh, which unlocks quite a lot of creativity. And smart alerts can also be shared with people. So you can just share a link to your smart alert and then other people can set up the same alert uh, on their side. Um, and then there are a few other things that we're working on to make thing, the things more sort of configurable and customizable. I do, I do, you know, naturally with my background in AI, believe that there's a lot we should be doing, especially with the recent advances in AI, where, you know, 
uh, users should be able to communicate with data more directly and through natural language um, in a way that can help them customize and kind of build their own models, so to speak. So I think we're definitely on that path of making the product more personalized and kind of more customizable for people because you should at the end of the day be able to create your own alpha like you don't want you should be able to cook your own meals too not just get the yeah. meal that we are serving yeah. you from the menu so so that's kind of that's how we look at it right now i would say though that our product is very much geared towards you know investors first and maybe analysts second you know it is it is a product that is geared towards certain workflows that help you invest and so it's not as such built for analysts necessarily. It's more built for the investors themselves. And investors often kind of don't want to spend a ton of time uh, building their own stuff, right? They often want things that are readily available. So let me just plug one, one last feature on that note. We have this feature now called Signals, which is basically a feed. And it looks a little bit like a Twitter feed. So you open it up. And you can see things like, I'm just looking at it right now, you know, smart money acquired about half a million dollars of MAP tokens in the past 24 hours. That's 7.5x the recent average. And then, you know, I have a bunch of those signals further down, which are based on certain anomal like uh, anomalies, you could say, that we see on chain. And we highlight those. So you don't have to do any analysis. It like just ends up in your feed. And then you can drill deeper and understand these tokens more if you want to. Excellent. Um, and it's interesting because um, yeah, customization is, is everything. But again, you don't want to overwhelm too many people. Mm. And I love that you're kind of raising people through the, the process too. So you can start as just kind of tinkering and playing with it. But to your point, you you want to be the dream maker at the at the end of the day, right? You want to be the big the big trader at the end of the day that others are learning from. That's yeah. awesome. And I also the last part about the feed that's really mm. interesting from a usability standpoint. You're taking cues from contemporary social media and mm. bringing bringing it right into the platform. Dare I say, like Bloomberg. Uh, which mm. is very interesting. I wasn't going to bring that up, but um, <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, as, as soon as you start looking at this and then you start, you know, hearing you talk about it, I'm like, wow, the, the, years ago, people used to pay ungodly amounts of money for these Bloomberg machines. And now, and then it went to a, all software and, and it's, it is about trusted solid data that you're getting from them. Um, yeah. Are you guys kind of like, uh, are you modeling yourself after that or? The companies that people compare us with, um, on the one hand, I would say that, you know, our focus is very specifically on on-chain analytics and on-chain data. We don't want to boil the ocean like we talked about earlier. Um, at the same time, we also want to position the product as kind of an information super app where you get everything you need as an investor on-chain in one place. And we do take inspiration from, for example, Bloomberg, Bloomberg Search uh, and Command Center. In Nonsen 2, we have created a search that I think is very powerful and has been optimized to kind of take you from A to B, from question to answer in the fastest possible way. Um, and then, yeah, we take inspiration from lots of other products um, that are adjacent to crypto or even totally unrelated to crypto. Um, so I would say the, you know, if, if you think about the strategy of Nansen, the category we play in is l a low barriers to entry one where you're always going to have analytics companies pop up in crypto because to your point earlier, the access to the fundamental raw ingredients you know, is, is relatively easy, right? A lot of this stuff comes from public blockchain nodes and things like that. So the way we stand out is by elevating the product itself and making sure that we're the product leader. We have the best coverage of chains. We have the highest quality of data. We have the overall best user experience. That's kind of how we think about ourselves. We try to counter position against other products in being super high quality and a clear product leader. 
And at the end of the day, that means, you know, you're bringing the most value to users as well. So uh, I think Bloomberg has a similar role. Of course, in tra traditional finance, you have other information products that are free or a lot cheaper, but somehow mm -hmm. Bloomberg is able to command a premium because it is a premium product that is very sticky. And of course, it has its own chat um, you know, network, which I think also drives a lot of the network effects, but that's a separate topic. Um, but yeah, so overall, you know, our strategy is to be the product leader in our category. And that's hard work, but it's why we get up in the morning. It is hard work, but it's refreshing to hear that you're not just looking at your crypto neighbors, you're looking at everyone and taking inspiration from a lot of different things, hardware and software, as you mentioned. Um, and yeah. that's, that's one of the things that I always tell um, product strategists or designers or whoever you you are, don't just look at who else is in the neighborhood, look outside and, and kind of take inspiration from a lot of different places. Because at For the sure. end of the day, you know, one of the things that AI is enabling us to do, uh, and, you know, I'm preaching to the choir here, uh, is talk in natural language, right? And I think yes. the rules are changing real fast for usability. So it's nice to oh, hear yeah. that you guys are putting your best foot I, forward. Hmm. Couldn't agree more. Go ahead. I mean, I, I, I yeah. do think on, uh, on, on AI, specifically for our category of data analytics, I do think this is going to change quite substantially in the next uh, few months and years to the point where, you know, the way you interface with data might completely change, right? Uh, yeah. you, could, you can think of dashboards as almost like a middleman. And maybe you somehow replace that middleman with an AI. And so, you know, you, you can kind of get a little bit science fiction on this, but you, have you watched the original Blade Runner movie with Harrison Ford in the in the eighties? Um, speaking my language, buddy. That's yeah. my favorite. I even like Twenty Forty Nine. It's one of my favorites too. Amazing, yeah. So you you'll probably remember the scene where Rick Deckard is sitting in the sofa and he is inspecting a photograph on his like kind of TV desktop looking looking thing, and he's like enhance, zoom in, pan to the left, pan mm -hmm. to the right, and. That whole user experience, which I think of as a combination of voice and visuals, that's maybe what the, the near-ish future of interfacing with data analytics might look like, right? Where you, you're actually speaking with a machine, but at the same time, I don't think the visual element disappears because our vision is our highest resolution sense. And mm -hmm. you probably want to make use of that for you know, analytical or cognitive work and so you're probably not going to have a pure voice and audio experience for relatively complex things that are easier to c communicate through vision. But the whole voice and visual combination that I think is pretty well exemplified in that Blade Runner scene, albeit in a completely different context, uh, that's maybe where the world uh, could be headed in the next couple of years. I love your analogy and uh, love the movie and i'm a sci-fi nerd that's why i'm in technology and design so that we can build tomorrow right yeah um and it, it you know again pulling inspiration from classics like that is is amazing and you're right to me i i, I mean i throw this out to some of my design friends like hey let's make websites go away they're really mm -hmm. annoying they're re truly annoying <laughs> How do we re-engineer the, the the new interface? What is it? And we're starting to see it with with AI when you're just talking to you know your desktop, whatever it may be, your yeah. phone, and and it's generating things. There's even hardware products coming out now uh, to augment people's phones and and their their you know everyday life. Um, it's fascinating, and and I think you and I could do a whole separate separate AI design. Uh, yeah. session on that uh, for sure. Um, and it is really, really exciting. Um, now that you bring up AI, how, you know, in the sense of Nansen and data mm. and, you know, grokking information and, you know, putting in and getting out data into this platform, how is AI enhancing my experience right now with Nansen? Yeah. Yeah. So it's probably worth just 
laying out briefly the AI strategy of Nansen, right? And we want to be an AI trailblazer. We want to be one of the companies that are really embracing and adopting AI very fast. And there are two overall ways to do that. Number one is we enhance the product. And I'll talk about specifically how we do it. And the other way to do it is we uh, make use of AI th for organizational and individual productivity in the company. So for example, this quarter, we are, so we're about 85 people in the company. Collectively, we're trying to spend 5,000 hours this quarter working with AI in any role, right? So that translates to about four hours a week, roughly, uh, per person. And that's on the organizational productivity side. Uh, I'll, I'll re refrain or I'll try to not go into that rabbit hole because I could probably spend an hour talking about that part. But if we right. go down the rabbit hole of the product side of things, right, th that's the organization productivity. And then there's a product. On the product side, there are three core pillars that we focus on. The first one is personalization. And again, if we think about science fiction, the, you know, maybe the best inspiration here is probably the movie Her, which takes it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. But, you know, because the guy falls in love with his AI. But I do think that one of the ways you can build a moat in the AI future on the product side is just fundamentally having incredibly good personalization to the point where you just don't want to switch to another product because it knows all your preferences. It's just so convenient. And you might not fall in love with the product like you do, like he does in the movie Her, but it all it's like almost there. It's like 50% of that experience. So personalization, of course, has many AI elements like recommender systems, making sure that you are using all the data that's being generated through, you know, uh, the way you're using the product and then making the whole experience more personalized. That's one big pillar. For example, if you connect your portfolio in Nansen in the next couple of months, you're going to be able to get personalized, uh, you know, alpha or personalized signals based on your portfolio. So like, you know, there are tens of thousands of tokens you could be looking at. And if we combine, like, here's something that is interesting from kind of a market perspective, but it's also relevant to you because it looks a little bit like a token you bought before. That's like a really interesting space to explore. And we're going to, we're, we're spending a lot of time on it now, uh, making the whole product more personalized. The second point is on interfacing with data. And we talked about that earlier, right? That's the Blade Runner enhance kind of concept which is a bit further out, but overall things like natural language search, um, things like being able to, you know, those smart segments I talked about earlier, where you can describe a segment that should be natural language too. You should be able to just say, give me the wallets that made a lot of money on, on board apes. And then it just spins up a segment and that's coming, right? It's in, in the works, uh, even if it's not, uh, there, uh, here and now. And then the third part, which is a bit more under the hood is, you know, we use AI to actually refine the data itself. So one of the things we have always done really well is labeling addresses. And so, in, and this is fundamentally a problem that has to be solved through uh, the combined efforts of man and machine. So you have to use algorithms because we're talking about hundreds of millions of addresses, but you also need to have a human in the loop who can quality assure things and kind of guide these algorithms uh, towards the right areas and even prioritize, like, these are the things we should be looking more closely at and maybe design algorithms uh, to tag them up. And so, um, 99 point, I think it's, I actually looked at this, the exact number. I think it's 99.96% of all our labels in the platform are algorith algorithmically generated and the rest are human kind of manually labeled. So this is the third area that I'm talking specifically there about labeling or attribution of wallets, but the broader concept of how can we refine our data and create curated data sets and even things like taking the raw Ethereum data and converting it to kind of a more manageable data set like Dex trades or NFT sales and making use of AI to do that parsing and transformation of the data. That's kind of the third pillar of how we make use of AI um, 
uh, at Nonsen. So, so those are the three core areas, personalization, interfacing with data, and refining the data to ultimately build a stronger mode. Fantastic. I mean, it's it's super interesting to see. I mean, a lot of people, including myself, are using AI, but it's to do your work faster, mm. um, get quicker results on things, and just do whatever you're doing. AI as a core principle is baked into your product um, by right. you and your experience and just what you explained. Um, and it, it'll be interesting you know, AI can do a lot of different things on day one, like literally it's in its infancy and it's quite mind blowing. Um, but it really accelerates when you're using a tool like this, where there's tons of numbers, there's tons of data. Um, you don't know what's trusted or whatnot. Um, and it actually understands you like the analogy, her or the operating system that, you know, the character falls in love with. Um, starts to understand and predict and create mm. models for you based on past uh, experiences within the platform. So really, really nice. Um, now, one of the other things that, you know, comes up almost every single podcast, every company I talk to is into this somehow, you know, privacy is king, uh, but transparency is basically part of the bedrock of, of Web3. Um, can you give us an idea of how Nansen straddles the fine line between privacy and transparency? Yeah, great question. I do think that these are ultimately two sides of the same coin, which also means that you cannot have full privacy and simultaneously full transparency. You have to make choices, right? And um, blockchains are inherently transparent which means, of course, we lean more into what are the uh, valuable things we can do because of the transparency that we can uh, either kind of just make use of or even enhance through things like labeling addresses. And so the privacy challenges probably come in where, for example, you know, an individual has their wallet and um, maybe they inadvertently shared uh, an NFT they bought on social media and, you know, our systems or processes pick that up and then you label that wallet and you say, hey, this is Rich Pasqua's wallet uh, because he showed off his board uh, ape or Pudgy Penguin on Twitter. And then you're like, oh, I don't, didn't want that to be labeled. And of course, many people might not even know that revealing that actually also reveals, you know, the, your wallet address indirectly. And so the way we straddle it just from like a policy perspective internally is firstly, you have to treat individuals separate from corporate entities. And when an individual maybe has been uh, labeled in such a way and they're like, we, we don't want, I don't want that to, to be in the platform. We of course respect that. And we remove the label uh, through kind of a right to be forgotten, right? Specifically for our platform. However, if a corporation comes to us and tries to do the same thing, it's a different matter because corporations are not entitled to the same type of privacy rights. And in that sense, I think of what we do as almost a journalistic effort, right? If um, a large corporation went to a newspaper and said, actually, I don't, don't want you to write that article that you wrote about us, like they don't have the power to take that down. Similarly, if we have labeled FTX as wallets, FTX can't come to us and say, you should remove those. We will say, look, here's the evidence we have that these wallets are indeed FTX wallets and we'll keep mm -hmm. them. So we do look at individuals and corporations as different and we respect the privacy of individuals specifically for our platform. Uh, I do think this though is kind of, you know, we, we are, it's almost like the phrase don't hate the player, hate the game comes to mind because blockchains are inherently transparent in this way. So even if I'll, I'll give you an example, right? I, I remember speaking to someone who had bought the ENS name. So the dot ETH name for his wife. And so it was the whole wife's name dot ETH and it was associated with his wallet. And that pops up in our platform because we parse out all the ENS names. 
that's a different matter because and they were like can you remove it and it's like actually this is etched into the blockchain it doesn't matter if we remove it it's still going to be on the blockchain right so it, yeah. so you you would have to go to every front end or user interface to like censor this so there's there's some nuance here and some challenges just inherently in the way blockchains are designed and i do think probably if you know uh a future that might be able to reconcile the privacy aspects with the transparency aspects is one where there you have kind of like um, pockets or certain uh, areas of a blockchain where you have actually full privacy and like we can't even track any of your, your transactions. But also from a regulatory perspective, you know, just seeing what happened with tornado cash and so on and how it's difficult for centralized exchanges to integrate privacy blockchains like monero you know sometimes they actually offboard them i think this was done recently with one of the big exchanges you know judging all those regulatory challenges too i don't see a world where you have full privacy and zero transparency on the whole blockchain i think maybe what it comes down to is like here's some area of the blockchain where maybe you can't make very large transactions somehow. I mean, it's a little bit dystopic actually, but you know, in the EU, you have limits of how large your transactions can be before they get reported to the authorities. Mm. And maybe it's something similar where like, there's just a cap of how large the transactions can be or the volume of transactions in the privacy uh, enabled pocket of Web3. Um, that's where you do your kind of your grocery shopping or your e-commerce purchases or whatever, which you don't want to reveal to the whole world. Um, but again, going back to the first point, I do think the transparency elements are very valuable. And this is why you could see, you know, FTX sending out funds to accounts in Bahamas, uh, even when they claim that they had, you know, stopped withdrawals fully, you could see in on chain that that wasn't true. And that's a great example of like how transparency can, you know, speak truth to power to some uh, extent. Um, but yeah, it is a fascinating and nuanced topic. Uh, I don't think you can go full transparency or full privacy. You have to carve out the very specific uh, use cases and areas where you favor one over the other. That's probably the way to reconcile it altogether. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, it's either one; of, it, it is a balance, right? So mm. you you have to go in one of the two directions. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think people were tracking Sam Bankman Fried right up to uh, you know, his capture with through his wallets and whatnot. They're still using all, all of that data to to build yeah. a case on him. Um, That's right. Really interesting, and. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, you know, people learn through use cases, right? Mm. Um, I do. Most people do. Um, how does this work? Show me an example, right? So can you give us a, uh, if you can, you don't know names, oh, but yeah. maybe. Can I uh, actually show, someone... can I show the product or yeah, <laughs> am yeah, I allowed to like demo it or because yeah, I, absolutely. I love yeah, I love doing that more than like hand waving. Um, yeah, let me see if perfect. I can just share my screen real quick here. Let's yeah, there should screen. be a share button down there. Yeah, perfect. Uh, here we go. All righty. Can you see my screen now? You got it. So I haven't really prepared anything, right? This is kind of this is how I like to do demos anyway, because every time you open up Nonsense, there's something new. So you can't really like prepare. Here's the exact you know insight that we're gonna see, but I show some of the stuff that I was talking about, right? If you if you just want to search for something, you could. We, we were just talking about FTX, right? So you could type that mm -hmm. in, and you have the entity here. Um, or an FTX exploiter, you have FTX US, and you could bring that up and just look collectively across, you know, the entities, what uh, the FTX corporate entity is actually holding, right? So this, and you can look at transactions that have been happening with this wallet. This might be, okay, it's actually, it was faster than I thought. So uh, it looks like, you know, there are entities that somehow are transacting with some of the overall uh, FTX entities, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh, maybe it's related yes. to the liquidation mm -hmm. of those assets or something Probably. like that. I'm not sure. 
Um, and then the signals piece that I was talking about earlier, you can see here, this is the signals feed where you might not have any specific idea of what you're looking for, but you can scroll down and find specific tokens that have had a centralized exchange inflow, for example, 16 X, the recent average looks like the price has really pumped on this one uh, as well. And the way it would look like is you just click through on this and then it loads all the information for this specific token. And you can see who bought uh, this in the last say seven days, who sold it. And you could even drill down on the specific addresses. If you wanted to, you can see the top transactions that happened in the last, actually let's look at the last 24 hours. And you can sort of filter out things like, I don't want to look at Dex trades. Um, yeah, so, so, and then you can, here's a smart Dex trader. Interesting, what are they doing? Okay, they've built up a portfolio of about $1.2 million. We call it a smart Dex trader because that means they made a lot of money trading on DEXs, right? So this would be a good one to maybe say, actually, I want to set an alert on this one and get notified of every token transfer they, they do. And now I have a way to get uh, notifications when interesting things might be happening on chain, right? As an example. So uh, obviously I could probably spend like, you know, an hour showing you all the different things, but that kind of gives a bit of a flavor. Um, in terms of specific success stories or, um, you know, what mm -hmm. customers have been able to do with the product, we, we have lots of different ones. Like there's one where when Luna collapsed or UST depegged, I think it was May, 2022, um, we had someone who'd set up smart alerts for the curve liquidity pools. So without going too much down the rabbit hole there, basically what that meant was where most of the liquidity was sitting for UST, uh, they had lots of money deposited and they had set up smart alerts and they got notifications when people were withdrawing from those liquidity pools. And they jumped, you know, to their computer, withdrew their liquidity because they felt something was was wrong. Like, why are people pulling their money? So they did the same very fast. And as a result, when UST depegged, you know, they avoided losing tens of millions of dollars as a result. Um, so that that was one great example of how people have used smart money. Uh, and then there are others who have dis discovered tokens uh, in Nansen and. You know, there's one, some, someone told me that they put like 500 bucks into a token and made it into like a million dollars or something, which is insane. That doesn't happen every day, but <laughs> there, there are a few examples of that too. So yeah, those are, those are two that come to mind for now. Yeah, that, th those are great. And just being able to, uh, you know, get alerts and understand what's happening with certain chains and, and assets um, you know, the, mm. the Terra Luna one depegging that like, that's, that's, that's an event that everyone knows, knows of exactly. if you're in the space, obviously, um, yep. that's pretty significant and what a signal that <laughs> that's sending. Um, oh, yeah. absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, what I also like, and thank you for sharing the interfaces because a lot of people, you know, a lot of times we just have to talk about the products, right? We want to touch yeah. and feel it. And yeah. uh, I would suggest like to our viewers and listeners, go and launch it right off the homepage of Nansen. Um, you can start to tinker with it and play with it and go, oh, I kind of understand this, or I might need a little more research here. But at the very least, you're going to be able to do what you just did, um, is kind of inspect things and kind of look at trends as they're happening or pitfalls for that matter. Um, so it's, exactly. it's, it's, it's phenomenal. I actually really want to dig into this a lot more myself. <laughs> you um, should. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to. Um, and... This is this is a time to do it, by the way. Like, I mean, the way the markets are right now, it's almost like last night I had this because I couldn't sleep for, you know, a variety of reasons. And then Bitcoin yeah. goes to $64,000. And yeah. then I'm like, Bye. okay, this is the type time of the cycle when it's too expensive to sleep. <laughs> It's like the feeling, yeah. feeling I had because you're just missing out on stuff. But the, 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 the more serious point is because the markets are so hot right now, 
the ROI of kind of spending a bit of time learning this stuff and doing a bit of research on different assets and tokens, I think it is a great time to be doing that, that work. And, you know, you, you might get uh, lucky or unlucky with your investments, but uh, this is probably the time when you have the best odds of succeeding uh, in the part of the cycle that we're in. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, 2024 is going to be a special year for a lot of reasons. Right now, like we are just kind of getting the bull mark, bull run kicked off. And it is a great way to look at your own assets that you have, look at how you're going to position yourself and or, you know, uh, invest in, in alternate projects that you might not have thought of. Um, and it is a great time to kind of learn a new platform or start to dig into a new platform to help you do this. And, you know, it's not just the bull run markets, right, Alex? It's, it's like, even on the, even on the bear markets, you, yeah. you actually want to do this even more. You want to right. be involved even, even more uh, yeah. so that you're, you're positioning yourself to, you know, uh, get your gains up uh, and kind of dollar cost average to kind of bring yourself back, back above water or, you know, yeah, maintain and the to, ship, of course. Yeah, and to and to defend your portfolio, right? We often talk about discovery, due diligence, and defense, right? So discovery, you find tokens, due diligence, you do the analysis on it, and then defense is about having, for example, alerts like the example I gave with with the depegging to defend your portfolio, so you're not going to get wrecked by someone dumping on you or or whatnot. Uh, so absolutely in bear markets, the defense component becomes very important. Oh, I like that term that you use defense, you know, defend your portfolio. I, I love that. Mm. Um, and it's so true. I never really thought, well, I kind of thought of it, not, not in those terms though. Um, mm. and it's really great. And, and everyone needs to do that because you are the, in most cases, the, you know, sole custodial uh, custodian of your, of your assets. And it's a lot more responsibility and there are no, new tools for everyone out there to use. And it, it's wonderful. Now, Alex, exactly. as we wind down a little bit, you mentioned um, you have about 80 plus employees right now at Nansen. Yep. Yep. 85, I think is the exact number. Yep. 85. Great. Well, wow, that's respectable and, and phenomenal for a software company such as Nansen, um, can you tell us a little bit, are, how is your team structured? Are they across the world? What's mm. going on with that? Yeah. So we're headquartered here in Singapore. Um, we have about uh, 25 people in Singapore and the rest are pretty much distributed across the, across the globe. Uh, we have people in San Francisco. Uh, we have people uh, on the East Coast in New York City. Uh, we have Lots of people in different places in Europe, London, we have quite a few folks, Berlin, Lisbon. Um, here in Asia, we have, like I said, many people in Singapore, some folks in Hong Kong, uh, in Shenzhen, in China. Yeah, so it's, mm. it's, we're basically spread out across, I think, 35 different countries in total. Wow. Uh, so That's we're awesome. like highly remote first. In fact, me and my two co-founders only all met in the same room after two and a half years of building the company. So wow. it's, it's, it's literally a remote first company in that regard. That's great. Um, thanks for sharing that. Cause you know, people who tune into this, this podcast and others, they, they are building or they want to build, or they want to be an entrepreneur and start a business in the web three universe. Uh, so it's always interesting to learn how team structures are built and, and the human capital behind. Yeah. The wonderful and world. then, and That's then just briefly on kind of how I run the company, um, we're basically partitioned into three overall areas. The first one is product or product engineering and design, PED. The second one is go to market, which is about kind of taking that product to market, right? Dis distribution, sales and so on, marketing. And then there's the org. So this is uh, ops, people, finance and so on. Um, I changed the way I run the company. I took a bit of inspiration from Jensen Huang from NVIDIA, and I try to have more direct, direct reports. So kind of a, mm. the higher up in the org, you should be able to actually have more 
direct reports. It's a bit counterintuitive, but it, and it goes against some of the advice I was given early on in my career. But so I have like 12 direct reports now, uh, which I think works, works really well. Uh, and then I work with my direct reports mostly in groups. So the PED group, the GTM group and the org group. Uh, PED, how can you just build the absolute best product, go to market? How can you grow and get this product out to the right customers? And then org, how do you build the best workplace in crypto? Um, so that's briefly how I've kind of structured the company and how I run it day to day. Great. Uh, thanks for sharing it. And it's, it, again, it's refreshing to hear that you, you guys are kind of putting such diligence into your team and the structure and the process that goes into this, because that's pretty much everything. And without the right team and the right processes, nothing happens, as you know. Um, for sure. So that's awesome. So just one last question for you. Um, in 2024, we already took, we, you and I know that 2024 is going to be special for a lot of mm. reasons. What are you most excited for in the coming year? Oh, man, there's so much stuff. Uh, it's hard to pick yeah. one. Uh, if you'll allow me to think a little bit out loud, um, yeah, sure, I do think sure. this is the year. This is the year that Web three gaming actually comes to market and succeeds. We're going to see lots of failed games for sure, but I know of a few that I'm really excited about uh, that are coming to market literally in the next weeks and months. So that's one area. Uh, I'm of course excited about everything that comes as a kind of secondary effect of the ETFs. So. With Bitcoin ETF now, I mean, you're seeing the benefits of that. It's, it was kind of a no-brainer, to be to be honest. But I think a lot of people needed to see it and practice that when you open up the floodgates to the institutional world, you're just going to have a rising tide lift all boats. And then similarly, with the hopefully you'll get an ETH ETF in a couple of months, uh, which I think will have a similar effect um, uh, on on crypto more broadly and. You know, the whole staking economy around ETH is exciting too with Lido and restaking, Eigenlayer and so on. Um, and and then, you know, the, the last point, like selfishly, I'm very excited to see the product updates we're going to make with Nansen because, yeah. you know, I have made a lot of mistakes as CEO, uh, as every, any founder will. I feel like we've kind of been able to put the company in the in the right setup with the right people now so that we have much higher product velocity. That means we get stuff to market way faster and we can respond faster to what's happening around us. And so like as a user of our own product, you know, because we dog food it all the time internally, I'm just very excited to see some of the launches that are coming up, you know, integrating portfolio tracking into Nonsense 2, making smart segments more powerful and so on. So like if I had to pick one selfishly, I'd, honestly, I'd pick like the, product upgrades that are coming with, uh, with Nansen. Uh, but yeah, from the market, I'd probably pick like web three gaming as one of the sectors I'm the most excited about. Yeah. And you, you, you brought up a really, really important topic that I, I bring up quite a bit on the podcast and it is 2024 and beyond is we're setting the foundation for not just engineers and smart, innovative people, we're talking about layers of jobs, layers of responsibilities mm. that are going to come as, and as I see it happening all the time. So, hey, we have a great protocol. We just launched. Well, you also have to advertise now. You also have to have really great, you know, product interfaces and design. Um, your communications need to be spot on. Um, you need public relations. Uh, CEOs need to be front and center in the spotlight. There's tons of tons of things and, you know, rising tides float all boats and I, I couldn't agree more. And it's going to be a very exciting uh, year. And I'm, I'm, you know, selfish for you. I'm excited about all of the uh, product enhancements that you've been talking about throughout the podcast. Very exciting, yeah. especially the, all the AI integration. Oh, that's yeah. really going to be special. So just, just to, just to make um, one quick, quick point on that note, right? I sure. kind of think of Nansen one, the version one of Nansen is kind of like the, the Tesla roadster. That was a product that was kind of for the rich enthusiasts, but it was not really accessible. And frankly, like, like price wise, but also 
you know, uh, in terms of the UX, if you will, not accessible to the everyday person. But then they launched Model S later, which was kind of more of a mass market product, right? And it was more accessible. And I kind of think of Nelson 2 as the Model S. It's, it's becoming something that is a bit easier to use. It's more intuitive and it'll be more accessible in different ways over time for folks uh, with different portfolio sizes. So uh, that's to me, it's really exciting that we're able to make the whole product more accessible and ultimately then it will have more impact because you're reaching more people with it, which is, and more people will become winners from using it. So yeah, I'm pretty excited about that. hundred percent. And, and I'm a, I'm a big fan of, Hey, you've got a great software package that once you start using it, you pretty much can't live without one of those things. Mm. And that's the, the, that's the, the golden ring for, for any product developer. Um, but starting with a light version is always good to get the masses in. And then it's like, Ooh, I want a little bit more. So you can kind of move up the food chain as you so choose. Um, and I exactly. believe you have three or four different pay models right now. Yeah, we have, we have basically three different plans. There's a free version of the product. There's the pioneer plan, which is $99 a month. And then there's a professional plan, which is $990 a month. Um, the professional one also gives you access to this, um, alpha discord that we have with other full-time mm -hmm. investors, which is quite a valuable thing in its own. Uh, but that's kind of the, the ladder we have right now. We, we are exploring, you know, the, the tier structure to see, you know, should there be another tier in between one of those, but you have to balance that out with the complexity you get from adding one more plan in the product. Um, yeah. but yeah, the, the idea is exactly what you said, right? Like it's kind of an iceberg structure where you're showing the tip of the iceberg first and then people get excited that they, they dig deeper they engage more with all these powerful features and then you know at some point you may want to upgrade to the next plan to get even more kind of of these carefully revealed powers um so yeah that's that's the approach yeah very cool very very cool um now are you going to be at any conferences, uh, speaking engagements that our audience may be interested in, or they might be going to their these yeah. events anyways? And you can interface. Yeah, I'll be I'll be at uh, Token Twenty Forty Nine in Dubai in April. That's the next mm -hmm. one I have coming up. I have a, a baby daughter here at home, so I try not to travel too much. Um, yeah. But that's one that's in the books. Uh, I'll likely also be in Bangkok. I think it's the week after for another, I think it's Southeast Asia blockchain conference or something like that. And then we have our own token 2049 in Singapore in September. Uh, and I'll also be there uh, on our home turf here in Singapore. So those are the main ones I've lined up for now. Very good. And um, selfishly for me, I'd love to see you in New York Maybe we'll see at NFT uh, NYC. That would be awesome. Oh yeah, uh, I should try and I go should there. Make it there. It'll be a lot yes. of fun. Yes, I love I love um, New York City. It's one of the best cities in the world. So yeah, I would love to it, make that it is. if I can. It is, and we would love to see you and do some in person chit chats and and other things too. And um, for our viewers, I'm going to put all the links, the Nansen links, uh, below, so you can track them, visit them, and start using the product. Um, Alex, thank you so much. This has been informative, pretty, pretty exciting too, to kind of see new tools emerging for advanced, you know, uh, investors to, you know, almost normies, you know, or people who are, you know, just getting into it. It's very yeah. exciting. So thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me, Rich. It was great chatting with you. Yeah. We look forward to having you back. Actually.